Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our YouTube channel. Uh, I hope everyone has been enjoying the messages coming through YouTube that cannot join us on Sunday mornings. I would like to encourage you that for those of you who can come back and feel comfortable to come back, that you would start coming back to our church and enjoying that time of fellowship and worship and encouragement together. I hope that uh, as, as things calm down, hopefully over the next few months, that uh, we can once again be united as a church. So today I'd like to uh, present our message, some announcements really quick, and uh, some prayer. But uh, first of all, the uh, gym floor, the process has slowed down a little bit. Uh, they have to redo part of the floor. So it looks like that will put us out about another week. So stay tuned. You should have gotten an email. If you're not on the church's email list, talk to Pastor Don, and he will get you on there. Uh, Next, Pastor Don and his family will be out of town this week, so you have me to deliver the message, and uh, my name is Pastor Ryan, I serve as the associate and the youth pastor here at our church. So that being said, I think that's about all for announcements this week. Uh, so let's get it back into a time of worship and a time of prayer to our Father in Heaven. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance to uh, join together over the technology that you have helped us to obtain and, and the blessing that it is to deliver a message that people who don't even come to our church uh, will hear. Father, I ask that you take the time of study that I've put into this week and you make it into a message that, it, that brings you glory, that brings you honor, and that speaks to the heart of your people. Father, I just thank you so much for this chance to serve here in this church and to serve the people here in this town and this community. And I just thank you for this wonderful place we have to gather. Father, I ask you now that you will send a spirit of worship and praise, a spirit of learning upon your people, that what is said here will prompt them to have a deeper understanding and greater respect for the worship of your name. I say all these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So for a while now, I have been feeling convicted from God on what we should teach from the pulpit here. Um, I've been seeking him out in, in my prayer time, in my study time, as to what direction that my next sermon should be focused on. And one subject kept coming up over and over again, and that is the subject of worship. When Pastor Don asked me if I wanted to, what I wanted to preach on today, I wanted to say the subject of why should I serve? Why should I serve in the church of God? Why should I use my gifts? But I felt convicted as we prayed and we looked at where we needed to go this Sunday God wanted us to speak on worship and the praise to his name. He kept putting it in my mind and on my heart. And so today, I feel the best way to honor him is to focus on a biblical understanding of worship and hopefully to getting back to the heart of worship, getting back to basics. I think we, I think we need to examine our church worship experience. So let me ask you, what is worship? I think worship as a word is easy to define. It's sometimes not as hard as we like to make it. I think we can define it as anything that brings glory to God. So many of you would say we do that well here at this church. Our church prays, we do communion, we preach from the Bible, and those are all worship. I think of all the things that are done well here. We have message and prayer requests going out all the time. We have people who pray over the church and the people in it constantly. And we have a senior pastor who preaches from the Bible and faithfully stands and delivers the word. And I hope you would say, I do too. But how is our praise and time for singing for God? Are we simply going through the motions of an old tradition? If so, is that good enough for us? 
So today, we are going to focus on worship as singing. Now before we begin, I want to give a quick disclaimer. I don't want it to sound like I'm attacking those who lead us in worship. I think they actually have one of the most difficult jobs in ministry. See, week after week, they have to get up on stage, and they are completely vulnerable to the congregation. They have to select the songs. They have to play the instruments. They have to sing with their voice. And all the while, they get compared to what other churches do. See, yet faithfully, we have a worship leader, a worship team that comes, and they do this faithfully week after week. So I don't want to sound like I'm attacking them. In fact, I don't think I can thank the people who come and lead our worship. I don't think I can thank them enough. Because every time they do, they bring us right into the presence of God. So if that's not it, we have to ask ourselves then, so what's the matter with worship? I can't help but think back to when I was a new Christian and I couldn't wait for the music to stop so the message could start. See, I went to church every Sunday and stood and sang because that is what everyone else did. I would count the number of songs performed, then I could hear the message and hopefully learn something new, gain some new insight or some answer to a question I had. But I was missing the point. My heart wasn't coming to serve and praise God. I came with an attitude of selfishness. Instead of coming to give, I came to get. Every church I went to had worship teams that were dynamic and talented. They had good equipment. Their singers were amazing. They had obviously practiced at great length beforehand. But see, none of that made me change my heart towards worship. I never really wanted that part of the service, and it always seemed like the price of admission to get to the part I wanted. I think our issues with worship are not about the instruments or the people playing them. I believe that sometimes we can look at worship and think about how it makes us feel. How much we enjoyed the song selection. But is that what's important? Is that what worship is supposed to be about? How we feel? How we enjoyed it? How many times the chorus repeated or in what year or book the songs were written? Church, it's time we look at worship and say, to God be the glory and praise. I want you, God, and I want to worship you, God, in spirit and truth, as you have commanded me to. I want to worship you because of who you are. I want to worship you, God, because it, it's about you, not about me. So today we are going to be in Psalms, and we're going to look at Psalm 95. As I am reading, I want you to see the psalmist's line of thought. He clearly states there are two choices for our worship here. We can respond in one of two ways. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the King, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declare an oath in my anger. They shall never 
enter my rest. The psalmist clearly states that when we gather together, we are to sing songs joyfully to the Lord. We should look at who God is as our Creator, Father, Savior, and Shepherd. And that should move us to want to offer Him praise. This shouldn't be pulling teeth. And I have to say, I think the more we learn about God, the more we see God move, the more we read His Word to ourselves, the more we will desire to sing songs of praise. The more we seek God for who He is, the more we want to worship Him. But is this something we should be doing as a church together? Is it talked about in other places of the Bible? So that brings me to the next question. Is corporate worship prescribed? On the handout, I put a list of passages I've studied for the message this week. You can see that there are many times that throughout the Old Testament that God's people are told to worship Him. How to worship Him? What happens when they don't worship Him the right way? Like the offering of the strange fire by Aaron's sons in Leviticus 10. Ultimately, what happens when they stop worshiping Him and are forced into exile? Such a large part of the Old Testament is dedicated to, what, to the what's, when's, why's, and how's of worship. It goes far beyond what we can cover today. If you want a quick glance, go to Exodus 7.16. And we see that Moses is told to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go so they can assemble and worship Him. Exodus 20, 1 through 11, is the first four Ten Commandments. And they point to having a relationship with God. And Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, shows how serious God is about how he should be worshipped when Aaron's sons disobey him. So what about the New Testament? Is there anything about there, since we are a New Testament church, is there anything in there for us? Well, we can go to John 4, 23, where Jesus himself says, But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. See, Jesus is showing us that we are to worship God. That God is the object of our worship, and it matters that our worship is genuine spirit of truth. One of the best passages I have found for the prescription of worship in the New Testament is in Paul's letter to the Colossians. You can find it in verses 3, 15 through 17, and I'm going to read them really quickly here. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, not only is Paul telling us to worship God, he points out that corporate worship of God has benefits not just to us personally, but each other. Let's go back and look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. So there is biblical grounds in both the Old and the New Testament for the practice of, wor- of singing and worshiping God. So what should we take from this? God cares about being worshipped. And he cares about how he is worshipped. So we get it. We're supposed to come to church and sing songs and praise God. But is that it? What does he do? 
So I'm glad you asked that question. Let me tell you that God blesses us in a number of ways when we sing worship to Him. So let me give you the results of genuine worship to God. First, we enjoy God more. God created man for worship. We are purposely designed to seek out and worship something. If we are not worshiping God in our hearts, we are worshiping something else. We are making idols. And see, idols are unable to take God's place, so they can only lead us to the next idol and to the next idol, and it creates a path of destruction for us. But when our worship is put into God, where it was designed to be, we experience his peace, his goodness, his assurance, and the joy of being in his presence. Psalm 16, 9 through 11 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So the first benefit of worshiping God is to enter in his presence, to feel the pleasures that he offers, the joy he offers, and the assurance of who he is. Next, it's a glimpse of heaven. See, as we look forward to what comes next, we read the book of Revelation. There's constant worship and praise for God in heaven. John writes the four creatures around the throne in Revelation 4. And he says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. See, God is being worshipped now. And he will be worshipped for eternity. And the soul that finds no joy in worship is not ready for heaven. And you can't be ready because your heart is not able to enjoy God for who he is. But for those who worship in truth and spirit, they will find joy and peace beyond what can, we can explain here. See, while worship might not be the only activity in heaven, it's going to be one of the main activities. I hope my new body has a better singing voice. But what about God? God loves our worship. In Genesis, when God creates, he says it is good. When he created us, he said it was good, knowing what would happen. Knowing we would not choose his way, and we would fall into sin. He knew that when he created us, but he loved his creation so much, he called it good. See, the only reason God would ever call me good is because of Christ's righteousness given to me. I don't know why he would love me so much that he would redeem me with the blood of his son. What I do know is that knowing he enjoys my song of praise and knowing what I've been forgiven of, what he has saved me from, I want to praise him. My heart was changed. It wants to praise God out of love for him. I know he loves my worship of him. And what better way is there to show him love than to bring him joy? Next, we draw near to God. The Old Testament believers could only draw near to God in a very limited way. They had the temple and the priests who led them, but most of Israel couldn't even go into the temple. When they worshipped, they did so from a distance because only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies and only once a year. This is not the way we worship anymore. Through Jesus, we offer worship directly into the presence of God. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the, 
over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. See, through, our, through Christ, our worship goes directly into the presence of God. We enter into the throne room and we lift our praise to God as we join with the angels and the creatures and the elders already praising him in heaven. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24 says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. To a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken. Because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches this mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the, than the blood of Abel. When we worship God genuinely, we draw closer to God. But, but as we draw closer to God, God also draws closer to us, and he ministers to us. James 4.8 reminds us that when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. There are few activities that we can do that draws closer to God personally and as a body gathered together like worship. When we gather in genuine worship with our hearts set on giving God his due glory and honor, he meets us. And I would say he does better than that. I hope you all remember when the temple was completed and they began the worship with music and singing, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God filled the temple with his presence, with a cloud so thick the priests couldn't stand and minister. God's glory filled the temple when his people sang his praise. And that's from 2 Chronicles 5, 13 through 14. We might not get this room full of smoke or a cloud, but we could get it full of the Spirit. We could offer real praise and real worship and watch that, what God does with that. I think if we made the decision to worship God today, I believe we would grow. I believe we'd grow not just in numbers, but also grow spiritually. I believe God would bless us beyond what we already have. I think when we begin to offer genuine worship to God, He will send His Spirit here. He will fill this place with His Spirit every Sunday morning when we gather here. And when we do that, and His Spirit is present, He will bring people here. We will grow not just in number, but in the Spirit when we genuinely worship Him. So this brings me to my final point. It's time to choose. See, so if we look back at Psalm 25, it talks about joining together in corporate worship for the joy of it. To offer a joyful noise to God. To sing to God talks about worshiping God for who he is and that he's our shepherd for, so, so we worship for what he has done as well. The generation that never got to enter into his rest who resisted him, grumbled and fought and tested. The psalmist doesn't leave a third option on the table. If we are not worshiping God, we are worshiping something. We are creatures created to worship. I've spoke about that before. We are going to worship God or we are going to worship idols. So we have to choose today. 
Today we must choose from now on what will our object of worship be. Will we sing songs of praise with hearts for God? Or will we harden our hearts? And will we seek after worship that pleases us? I can think of someone who said it a little better than I could. So let me quote them. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Thank you. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the word that you have given us, that you have preserved throughout history. We thank you for the spirit that moves as we, we read, as the pastor preaches from the Bible. Father, that the spirit that comes in genuine worship, we praise you for all of these things. And Father, I ask now that we all examine ourselves in our worship and our praise to you. Are we being genuine? Is our heart genuinely worshiping you? Come, be the object of our worship for ourselves and for our churches. May everything we do come before you and give you glory and praise and honor and all, and all that you are due. May we join with the the creatures, and sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Father, as we go out this week, we make the choice. Do we choose you in your worship? Or do we continue to choose to worship other things? So bless our hearts. Convict our hearts of what we are worshiping. And may it turn to you. We say these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all.